Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Uh, again, I want to thank you for joining us on this beautiful Shabbat. <clears throat> Pardon the time, but my wife and I, the Arabic and Gabriela, we're taking our time today reading through all the um, the scriptures of this week's Torah portion, which we do every week, but this week was a bit longer. And it was really fun because it, it was about uh, eight books just in the Brit Chadashah, the New Testament or New Covenant uh, that had different scriptures. So we, we read through the Torah portion, the Haftarah, which is also two books from two different books in the Judges and in the, in the books of the prophets, and then um, <clears throat> eight different books in the Brit Chadashah. So it took quite a while to read through all that. So <clears throat> I suggest you do the same because it's a really wonderful way to spend Shabbat and it's really cool to see how these, these scriptures fit together, how they uh, tie in together from the old and the new. And um, so we really enjoyed that time today. Today is Parashah Vayishla, which means, and he sent. And we're going to be talking about taking hold of the blessings. So before we start, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce myself again. My name is Rabbi Harel Clint Fry here in Perugia. Italy. And before we start, I want to open the time in prayer. So Abba, Father, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time to be in your presence, just studying your word, reading your word, and delving deeper, digging deeper, and discovering new things about your word every day. And I just want to ask you to guide me that the words that come out of mouth will be from your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, and not from my flesh. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. So <clears throat> we will start with reading the first verse, as we always do. Yaakov, or Jacob, sent, or Vaishlach Yaakov, messengers, or Malachim, ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, Genesis 32, 3. Just so you know, this area of the land of Seir, the country of Edom, is where the modern day um, <coughs> land of Jordan, or Cisjordania, is on the east side of the Jordan River from Israel. Last week in Parashah Vayetzeh, Yaakov, or Jacob, fled from his home in order to escape his twin brother Esau's wrath and went to Haran, where his mother's brother Laban lived. On his way, Hashem appeared to him in a dream in which he saw a ladder that uh, reached from heaven or from earth to the heaven. And on the ladder, there were angels going up and down, ascending and descending, it says in the word. At its top, above all of it, overseeing everything was Adonai, who renewed the <clears throat> at that moment the Abrahamic covenant with Jacob. In Haran, Jacob worked for 14 years in exchange for his wives, Leah and Rachel, which he didn't quite get Leah. He didn't work for her purposely, but he had to if he wanted to get Leah. And these were Laban's daughters. Then he had to work for another six years for his own flocks. <clears throat> okay, so this was pretty amazing. I was the kind of guy I wanted to have working for me. <clears throat> so in the end, he managed with great difficulty to free himself from an unfair situation in which Laban, his father-in-law, had changed Jacob's wages 10 different times. So <clears throat> Laban was not being upright, I think it is his own son-in-law, but he was not being upright with him. In this week's Torah portion, Jacob returns to his ancestral home in the Holy Land, in the land of Canaan, or Canaan, with his wives, children, and possessions after serving his tricky and conniving uncle for 20 years. And the title of this week's parashah, like I said, is Vayishlach, which comes from the open, opening verse, Yaakov sent, or Vayishlach Yaakov, which refers to his sending Malachim, which are messengers, to his brother Esau. <clears throat> this Hebrew word Malachim can also mean angels. Okay, so angels are also called Malachim. Because what do they do? They bring messengers, right? Hashem sends forth as messengers on earth to do his will. So over 20 years have passed since the brothers last saw each other. Before leaving home, 
Yaakov had tricked his blind father into giving the firstborn blessing to him by pretending to be Esau. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I know I used to have a brother who was alive, uh, who passed away many years ago, but he would definitely not be the kind of person I would want to do that to if he had been the firstborn. Uh, thankfully, I'm the firstborn, so I didn't have to deal with that. <laughs> but all joking aside, I don't think uh, <clears throat> too many people would have an easy time going back to this kind of situation where they knew that the brother at that time wanted to kill them, right? So Jacob worried, like I said, that Esau is still angry about losing his blessing. And it seems that Jacob is correct, maybe. The messengers that Jacob sent out to re sent out return to the camp and say, hey, Esau is on his way with 400 armed men. <clears throat> so what do you think? So he comes up with, with a, a very winning strategy. Since Esau seems intent on killing him, at least that's what it seems like. Doesn't really say in the Bible what his intent is, but <clears throat> if he has 400 armed men, Jacob devises a three kind of a three pronged strategy of prayer, <clears throat> tact, and diplomacy, as well as preparing for war, the just in case, right? So he humbly seeks Hashem in prayer and a teshuva, which is repentance admitting that he is unworthy of the kindness and faithfulness that Hashem has shown to him by pouring out his blessing of family and wealth. And I know many times I have gone through Hashem and thanking him for the same thing, saying I am not worthy. I messed up so many times. So I think all of us could stand to have a little bit of humble ability, as one of my old friends would say, and do the same, especially when we know we are called to do something or just simply being blessed greatly by Hashem. He also admits that he's afraid of his brother, but he asks Hashem to save him, reminding him of his promises. He says, but you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. This is found in Genesis 32, 12. <clears throat> so Jacob then sends a whole bunch of gifts to his brother in the form of herds of goats, camels, cows, donkeys, the herds, are placed in the hands of his servants who are provided with a very strategic script to speak in, in and a sequence for the delivery of the herds that will hopefully disarm Esau's wrath. And you can look it up yourself, Genesis 32, verses 16 through 20. Jacob also divides up his family and his possessions into two camps to make sure, to ensure the survival of at least some of them in case something goes down, sends them across <clears throat> the Jabbok River, which is an eastern tributary of the Jordan River. Just look it up. It's really cool to see where these places are. We've been looking up these places on the map and definitely want to go see them if ever given the chance. It says, in great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups and the flocks and the herds and camels as well. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. Genesis 32, 7 and 8. <clears throat> so now he wrestles with Hashem. After this is all happening, he's camping by himself. He's sleeping by himself while the rest of them go on. Finding himself alone that night, Jacob wrestles with a mysterious man or an ish in Hebrew until daybreak. When this man cannot overpower Jacob, he touches the hollow of Jacob's thigh so that it's dislocated. I think that's kind of low. I was thinking, man, that's kind of low. I mean, just because you, you're, you're, you're being, I don't know, not defeated, but because you can't win, you're going to touch a poor guy's hip and make it dislocated so you'll win. <laughs> I, I hope I never have to wrestle with, with God. All right, because we come to find out that <clears throat> it's not just an angel or a man. It's actually God himself. So this angel asked Jacob, let him go. He says, let me go. But Jacob wants something first. He wants a blessing. He says, I will not let you go until you bless me. That's really courageous and incredible. And this is found in Genesis 32, 26. So the, the man does bless him at the end and changes his name from ya Jacob or Yaakov, which remember, <clears throat> means by the heel or supplanter or deceiver, to Yisrael or Israel. He says, your name will no longer be Jacob. But Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Okay. 
So this, <clears throat> through this kind of all night wrestling match, I mean, I can't imagine the strength that Jacob had to build a wrestle with God of an angel all night long. He comes face to face with the divine, with Hashem. Because of that, Jacob calls this place Penny Ed, okay, which means face of Hashem. If you ever think of the word, the, the phrase pan, uh, panim el panim, it means face to face. Okay. So that's pretty good. It means face of Hashem, peni el. For I have seen God or Elohim face to face, and my soul is preserved. This is found in Genesis 32 30. We can understand also from this wrestling match that some struggles have a supernatural dimension. And while we may at times wrestle with Hashem ourselves and his messengers, because he does send messengers, maybe in the form of a person, <clears throat> might be a direct word from him, but he does send them. More often, we wrestle with evil itself. The book of Ephesians also highlights the concept, telling us to be strong in Adonai's power since we wrestle evil spiritual forces. Okay, so it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, Ephesians 6, 12. <clears throat> so, all right, now we can see this happening, especially in the, when it comes to regard to rulers and authorities who are being used by Hasatan, the enemy, Satan, the deceiver, to bring about many evil things. But we know this is necessary for the kingdom of Hashem, the kingdom of God to come forth, okay? To come down and for Yeshua to turn back. So we should be happy this is all happening and stop complaining, okay? Because if you're a believer in Yeshua, you don't need to love the world. You don't need to say, oh, why is this all happening? I want to be left in peace. No, we need this to happen, people, because... And it's all part of his plan so he can bring forth his kingdom and we see, so we can go home. So if you don't want that to come, maybe you need to research your heart and ask the Lord to show you what needs to be changed. Okay, we're not here to make houses and homes and get comfortable, people. We're here to bring forth light and even die maybe. Many will die for their, for their uh, testimony, okay, their witness. And that's that. So be glad. Be glad this is happening. And we need to get out there and tell people the truth because that's what needs to happen before he comes back. All right, not get all comfy and cozy where we are. I hope this is all just goes away. It's not going to go away. Now, speaking of that, this talks about coming into maturity. Jacob's wrestling match also seems to take him all the way from full circle from an infant who struggled with his brother for the first time in the womb of their mother <clears throat> to a man who struggled for his blessing first from his father and then from Hashem himself. Jacob seems to have even wrestled himself into spiritual maturity. So with his new name comes a new identity. From Jacob, which like I said, means uh, by the heel, supplanter or deceiver to Israel, which actually means, um, it doesn't just mean he wrestled with Hashem. It means prince of Hashem or righteous with Hashem. <clears throat> okay, they have these three different meanings in Hebrew. So even today, the Jewish people, it's kind of interesting, continue, which are descendants of Jacob, continue to wrestle over the identity of this divine man, the Ish that he wrestled with, like I said, who is probably perhaps a manifestation of Yeshua himself, the Messiah, Jesus. <clears throat> All right. So Jacob's strategy of praying before taking action brought about the desired results. And Esau comes to his brother in peace, at least momentarily, right? Unfortunately, later on, they're not so peaceful a couple generations down the line. But for the moment, they're okay. This parasha shows that over the years, <clears throat> both Jacob and Esau had matured. I mean, 20 years had passed. And the old walls of recrimination, suspicion, and hatred had been broken down. This resulted in at least a degree, like I said, of reconciliation. Although they are reconciled and eventually bury their father together in Hebron, they also have go their separate ways with Esau settling in Seir, which, like I said, is on the other side of the Jordan in the <coughs> Jordan, the country of Jordan. 
And you can see this in Genesis 36, 8 and Deuteronomy 2, 12. And Jacob is in the land of his father, Canaan, in Genesis 37, 1. So Esau took his wives and sons and daughters and all the members of his household, as well as his livestock and all his other animals, and all the goods he had acquired in Canaan, and moved to a land some distance from his brother, Jacob. <clears throat> so despite this reconciliation, they realize they have a lot of stuff too, and they need to be separate. <clears throat> but I mean, there could be kind of like Abraham a lot. Remember, they went their own ways because they had so many things. It's the same thing here. So it seems also the seeds of hatred maybe seem to have been deep in Esau, or maybe not in him directly, but in his people. Remember, he married Canaanite women, which the mother and father did not want, and neither did Hashem. And throughout the centuries, centuries, alliances with the Edomites, <clears throat> who God says he will destroy completely from the face of the earth. He will not leave one Edomite alive. Not one. So it brought about at least superficial loyalty. But there's also been much fighting. Hatred always seemed to bubble up within his descendants as violence toward Israel and the Israelites. So <clears throat> speaking of an ancient hatred, it says, this is what the sovereign Lord says about Edom, Obadiah 1.1. 1, 1. And that's part of the Haftarah portion of today is the book of Obadiah. It's one chapter. The prophetic reading for Baishlach is from the book of Obadiah, which prophesies the restoration of Israel as well as a judgment and complete destruction, not just partial, complete destruction of Edom, the descendants of Esau. Remember in the last parasha, I said, God hated Esau and loved Jacob. Or he rejected him. Pretty ugly, but it says it right there in the word. In this very short book of Obadiah, there's like I said, it's one chapter. Obadiah pinpoints the reason for Edom's destruction. That is violence, hatred, and also um, standing aside, watching Israel get destroyed at certain times but their violence toward Israel. Okay, so those who speak against Israel, or at least the people of Israel, you need to watch what you say because you're bringing curses upon yourself. It says, because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. Obadiah 1.10. This is pretty serious, people. It's going to happen. That destruction will be so complete, Obadiah says, that there will be no survivors in the house of Esau, <clears throat> Obadiah 1.18. So this is yet to happen in the end times, and it will happen. There is a message here that we should not ignore, brothers and sisters. When we fail to repent of hatred, resentment, and unforgiveness, it can poison or even destroy the next generations that follow us. Yeah, your children, your grandchildren. <clears throat> Look how it's poisoned Esau and all his descendants, all the Edomites. The prophet Ezekiel also warned that Hashem would destroy Edom for its violence against the children of Israel and desire to possess the Holy Land. In Ezekiel 35, 5 through 15, it says, because you harbored an ancient hostility, <clears throat> this is just a shortened version, okay, <laughs> and deliver the Israelites over to the sword, I will give you over to bloodshed and it will pursue you. Because you have said these two nations and countries will be yours and we will take, take possession of him, of them. You will be desolate, Mount Seir. You and all of Edom. So Hashem makes it very clear in his word that the promised land belongs to the descendants of Jacob and not to the descendants of Esau, <clears throat> even though there are some now, even though both were the sons of Isaac and grandsons of Abraham. Pretty amazing. It says Jacob will possess his inheritance in Obadiah 1.17. <clears throat> so Obadiah's message is entirely relevant to the world today. Because Obadiah also warns the nations of judgment concerning Israel. The day of the Lord, or of Adonai, is near for all nations. And it's really near now. If he wrote that back then, it's really near. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. Remember what we talked about? This is in Obadiah 1.15. Remember what we talked about last week? What comes around goes around. <clears throat> so in other words, what you do, whether good or negative, will come back on you eventually. Okay. I don't want that for anybody. I know I've had things happen to me because of things I've done. And it's really not a pleasant thing. 
So I'm hoping that at the age of 53, I finally learned my lesson. <laughs> this law of reciprocity <clears throat> has not only worked, like I said, with negative, it also bring, can bring blessings. <clears throat> the God of Israel has promised to bless those who bless the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel, in Genesis 12:3. Still, like I said, there are those people today who make a claim to this land of Israel who say this land is ours and we'll take possession of it and drive those Jews into the sea. That's the Palestinians. <clears throat> Sorry, it's not going to happen. There are those who, who don't think this way, but there are those who do. Those who make this kind of a boast are boasting against Almighty God. Okay, Adonai. Who does not take attacks and threats against Israel very lightly. And he's going to destroy these people. It's just a matter of time. Hashem will accomplish his purposes in his land of Israel. Everything that he's promised to his people will be fulfilled. He is a promise keeper. He's a promise maker and promise keeper. <clears throat> he says, on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy. Obadiah 117. <clears throat> this is when Yeshua is going to come back and reign. So, in conclusion, I'd like to also talk about the power of the tongue, because in this, <clears throat> sorry, my throat's really bothering me. In this portion, this parasha, we find out at the end that Rachel dies giving birth to her last child. Okay, Benjamin. Remember what happened last time when Laban came after <clears throat> his son-in-law, Jacob. He said, what did you do? Why did you take my idols, my gods? Because Rachel had gone into his far father's tent and taken these gods and hidden them and, and hid and, and, and stole them. <clears throat> and Jacob didn't think anybody had done this. He thought he was just being accused falsely. Didn't realize that Rachel had taken these things. And he said, whoever has these things, if anybody is found with these things, they will not live. <clears throat> not exactly. He maybe should have shut his mouth at that moment and said, nothing. <laughs> so the Proverbs, Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. We got to remember what we say can and most likely will come about. <clears throat> in Rachel's case, that appears to have been especially true. Jacob and his family are making their way south through the land of Canaan toward Hebron, where his father Isaac was still living. While the family travels, Rachel goes into labor with her second child. She had named her previous son, Joseph, meaning may he add another son. <clears throat> Hashem had answered her prayer and she gave birth to a second son. This is necessary <clears throat> so that they could have the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember, each son of Jacob was one of the 12 tribes or one of the fathers of the 12 tribes. So, Rachel suffers a very severe and hard labor. As a child was being born, the Divine Wife tried to cheer her up and say, do not fear for you have another son. But Rachel knew she was dying, right? She, she, she knows she's dying and she dies. So she dies some distance from Ephra, which is another name for Bethlehem. And if you're going toward Bethlehem, I've been there one time, you go there on a bulletproof bus, Right outside of Bethlehem, just <clears throat> not too far, there's Rachel's tomb. And it's really amazing because she's all there by herself. She didn't die with the rest of them, get buried with the rest of them in Hebron, like <clears throat> all the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and then eventually her, her husband, Jacob, and his other wives. So Jacob buries her there, sets up a tomb, and on the side of the road and set up a sacred stone over her tomb. Right now it's a little building <clears throat> with her tomb inside because people go and pray to her. So <clears throat> the story provides etiology behind this landmark. The Torah actually remarks, it says Jacob set up a pillar over her grave. That is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. <clears throat> Genesis 25, 20, 35, 20. So like I said, it's still there. You can see it, visit it. I don't go there to pray, but it's interesting to just to see where this incredible woman is buried. Jewish tradition connects the tragic death of Rachel with the story from the previous Torah portion. In the previous Torah portion, last week we read that Rachel stole her father, like I said, Father Laban's household idols. 
when they fled from, to Canaan. <clears throat> Jacob didn't know about this step. So Laban comes up and says, demands the return of his household gods. Rachel's hiding them on her camel, camel and nobody knew about it except her. So Jacob swears an oath to Laban. He says, the one with whom you find your gods shall not live. Well, Laban never finds the gods, <clears throat> but God knows they're there. Rachel knows they're there. Genesis 31, 32. So with these words, Jacob inadvertently spoke a curse over his most beloved, most favored wife. Poor guy. Like I said, it's just better to be quiet. I would have said, hey, well, if you find him, you can have him back. I don't want him. So though <clears throat> her mother, Rachel, was not guilty of any transgressions for which someone might ordinarily die in childbirth, <clears throat> nevertheless, because Jacob said, with whomever you find your gods, you shall not live, she was punished. Also, if you think about it, by taking the gods, she was still into the idols, into these false gods. She had not given those up instead of following the one true God. So but her judgment is not carried out until she's in childbirth. Birth. That's a nice word, childbirth. <laughs> so the story of Rachel's death illustrates the master's warning against swearing oaths. <clears throat> and he says, Matthew 5, 36 and 37, nor shall you make an oath by your head for you cannot make one hair white or black. Mine are white mostly, <laughs> but let your statement be <clears throat> yes, yes or no, no. Some version says, may your statement be yes, let, or let your yes be yes and your no, no. So anything beyond this is evil. Okay, that's what the word says. We need to be careful when you even say, I promise to do something. Okay, that's like saying, no. How oftentimes have we done that and not come through? It's really important to not even do anything. Unless we know within the next few minutes that we can provide that promise that we make. Otherwise, it's better to be quiet. <clears throat> Rachel's tragic and premature death sets her apart from the other six mothers. According to tradition, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, Bilhah, and Zilpah, with all the rest of their all the rest of them with their husbands, have been buried in Machpelah in Hebron, in this huge building. There's different tombs all over the place. Rachel lies alone, right beside the way to Bethlehem. She appeared again, alone, mourning the exiles being led off to Babylon in Jeremiah 31, 15. She raised her voice again over, her, over the slaughter of the innocents of Bethlehem in Matthew chapter 2. And people still visit her tomb today, like I said. <clears throat> you can still visit. You can visit all their tombs, actually. It's pretty amazing. People go there, like I said, to pray. Even King David's tomb in, 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 in Jerusalem, people go there to pray. I just think it's interesting to visit them to see. It's pretty interesting to see, wow, thousands of years later, there's our, 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 our ancestors, but that's about it. So what I'd like to do now is just close this time by opening up <clears throat> Gift of Salvation, and I'm inviting you to, um, to uh, be accepting Yeshua as your Messiah. Like to say this prayer with me. Now is the time to do it. Like I said, we don't have long before Yeshua comes back and there will be a point in time when it will be too late to accept him. And you do not want to spend your eternity rediscovering that you were wrong. <clears throat> so it says in the Bible, those who believe in me will be saved. That's what he says. Okay. And it also says that Yeshua is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one, absolutely no one, can come to the Father except through him. Okay, so he is the only way to salvation. If you don't believe me, just read Isaiah 53. And if you'd like, I can send you a free book. Just contact us below, the contact link below. And I will be so glad to get you that book for you to read. It's called Isaiah 53 Explained. So... If you'd like to say this prayer with me, I invite you to say it now. Maruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu eterech ha-Yeshua ve-Mashiach Yeshua. In English, it's simply, blessed are you, Lord our God, 
King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah, Yeshua. So thank you for joining us today. <clears throat> I want to invite you to leave comments. I noticed nobody left any comments from last week, even though I said, hey, leave me some comments. Tell me what you think about this. So I'm inviting you to do that now. <clears throat> Let me know what your thoughts are on these parasha. I really like to hear from people and in the comment section or the, the, the contact link. Either way, if you need help with counseling, biblically-based counseling, the rabbit in Gabriela uh, is a licensed counselor. <clears throat> she can help you with that. If you'd like, people need help. There's no shame in asking for help. In fact, the Lord calls us to do it when we need it. First of all, we're to call upon him. <clears throat> Secondly, he sends people to help us too. So she is licensed, and there is a link below. It's called Machate Shiltikva, and there's a wonderful link to that. And also, if you'd like to, if you if you feel led um, by your heart to help support us in any way, there's also a link at the very bottom where you can send your support. If not, may you be blessed with the ironic blessing. I would like to close this time together. Yevarecheka Adonai Berish Merecha Yae Adonai Pana Velecha Vihuneka Yisadonai Pana Velecha Besem lecha, besem lecha, shalom. Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach, Sarah shalom, shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, shalom. Shabbat shalom to all of you and may you have a wonderful Shabbat. I'll see you next week.